So our next topic is electron beam lithography or commonly known as e-beam lithography or EBL. So I'm only going to provide a very, um, you know, very simplified introduction kind of class because we don't want to go into the details of the physics. We just want to understand that this is also one more technique that can be used in microfabrication. For example, we've learned about photolithography. We have also learned about X-ray lithography. Okay. So in the case of electron beam, as the name itself suggests, you have a beam of electrons and you are somehow using that beam of electron for, because it's a lithographic technique, you're going to write something on certain substrate in a certain material. And in most cases, in all lithographic techniques, you're going to use polymers. So what you're doing now is you're going to use a beam of electrons to selectively degrade or cross-link a polymer. In most cases, it's the degradable polymers, which are basically positive resists. Huh? But there are also some negative resists that can be used um, along with the electron beam. So what does an electron beam do? Until now, what we were do doing is, uh, you know, in the case of uh, photolithography, you use UV light, you use X-rays. So we were using certain wavelengths, certain, um, we, are, we were providing energy using certain types of photons to our material so that it either crosslinks or degrades so that those were photosensitive materials. But here with the electron beams, what we are doing is we are actually providing a beam of electrons, which is sort of hitting your material. Now, electrons have um, can have very high energy and we can also, in fact, control the acceleration and energy and the speed of the electrons because we are actually drawing electron from a certain electron emitting source. Hmm. So here we can have very high intensity, very high energy electrons, which can actually completely degrade your material. And we can also, you know, moderate the energy and we can use them with negative photoresist. So this is the idea. Now, as you must have understood, now here we uh, rather have some technique, which is serial. You have a beam of electron and you write hmm, rather than having a mask and rather than having a, you know, exposure to the radiation. Now what you're doing is you're writing. Hmm, so this means it's a, it's a slower process uh, compared to the other batch fabrication processes. The, uh, the answer is yes. But why do we use EBL? Because the feature sizes that we make using electron beam lithography, they're much, much finer. You can very easily get nanoscale structures. So here in the schematic, you can see that you have this electron beam, which is moving, huh, which you can, by the way, control using any CAD software. So what you do is you can make a design which can be any complicated design. Hmm. You can make your own picture. You can make any very complicated design as long as you can make a CAD file out of it, which can be, um, you know, which can be uploaded into your system. And the system then reads it and writes it with this electron beam pen accordingly. Hmm. So in fact, this is one of the advantages of e-beam lithography that you have very automated things. So it's a long process, but what you can do is you can upload your design at night and go home and in the morning it's done. So it's slow, but you don't have to be there all the time. So it's automated. So anyway, this structure that I showed, maybe this is how the top view would look like. You have a substrate and you have some polymer structures and the spacing between these structures and the, and the, the widths of these uh, structures, they are very, very fine. They are definitely in the nanometer scale. In fact, you will not use e-beam lithography if you are going to make very large structures because it's of course it's also an expensive technique you're using electron beam a expensive b relatively slow so you will only use this technique when you want to make something that is not possible using photolithography or other standard techniques okay so um as i mentioned the critical dimension so that is the smallest feature size hmm? that can be very small yes as a rule of thumb, not just for e-beam lithography, but for all the lithographies, your beam diameter, whenever you're using a beam to write something, it can also work for lasers, for example. Whenever you're using a beam to write any structures, generally your um, critical uh, dimension or the smallest st structures are four times into the, uh, four times that of the beam diameter. Hmm. So um, electron beam diameters are very, very small. And that's why even four times the beam diameter is still in the nanometer scale. OK, um, so of course, as I mentioned, it's expensive. One of the reasons why this is an expensive technique is because when you have an electron beam and electrons will only survive under very, very high vacuum conditions. So you need to maintain the high vacuum at all times. 
Hmm. So that is uh, what makes this technique very expensive. It's similar to scanning electron microscopy. It's similar to transmission electron microscopies. Now, in the case of scanning micro, uh, electron microscopy, sometimes you can turn off the beam. You can you don't have to have the vacuum. Only when you are imaging your sample, you will turn on the vacuum. And once you reach the right value, you will turn on your beam, and then you switch off everything when you go. But in the case of TEM, transmission electron microscopy, you will typically have the vacuum on all the time. And whenever you need to do that then this uh, the techniques always become very expensive because they are very high maintenance techniques okay now how do we get the electron so i told you that we get some uh, electron emitters so that's something there is a source of electron which emits electrons so how do you do that you can have something like a wire hmm. and that is a if that is a metal wire you can do two things either you can keep make this wire an electrode and there you can have another electrode here and create really high voltage difference so high that there is a emission of electrons but that is not typically done what is in what is more commonly done is something known as thermionic sources so you take an electron source which has to be of course a conductive material so you take a conductive material a wire like structure but what you then do is you increase the temperature of this material. So at some point the temperature is very high because of the temperature. And then of course there is also some, uh, some voltage provided. So because of these two effects, the electrons are ejected at a certain temperature. The electrons are ejected. So, so, thermionic, so thermionic sources are actually more common. The other sources where you don't want to use heat for a certain reason, then you uh, you can use also what is known as the cold sources. Cold sources you will typically give you a better beam uh, diameter, so smaller beam diameter. But um, what is more commonly used is thermionic sources because they are much, um, it's less expensive and also um, you get a continuous beam of electrons. Okay. Um, now, some of these examples will tell you these are the, the common materials um, that are used for um, these are the commercially available uh, sources of electron. Tungsten wire can also be simply used as an electron emitting source. Okay. And um, these are typically electron emitter would be your cathode. And now once your beam is out, the electrons will try to go everywhere unless you focus your electron beam. And this focus is done using magnetic lenses huh? so uh, not optical lenses but magnetic lenses which will basically focus your beam so in your electron it's also the case with tem and sem you will have kind of a multiple lenses and a big optics so it's like a tower which has multiple lenses which focus the beam such that it becomes straight hmm. okay so now you can imagine what are the challenges of this technique first of all think about the sample Okay, you use, um, let's say, PMMA as a resist, which is a common resist for, uh, for uh, electron beam lithography. You use PMMA as a resist, and now you want to write on top of it. Of course, you can write very fine structures, but also if the electron um, acceleration is a little bit high, the energy is slightly more than what you wanted, then you can also damage the material very fast. That happens with, again, all kind of uh, electron microscopy techniques also that you need to find the right voltage of your beam in order to get the right size of structures. Otherwise, you can cause damage, mechanical damage to the material. Okay, the electron scattering is another problem. Back scattering, scattering of all kinds is a problem and that's where we need to use good lenses and we need to ensure that. Um, the samples are also, um, different materials will provide different kinds of uh, scattering and that is why, again, uh, optimizing the voltage also helps in this case. <coughs> okay, formation of islands when you are trying to make structures, you don't have perfect structures because of the, you know, uh, beam uh, is not continuous at some point. So you may end up getting formation of islands. And then there are also uh, defects because of your data, because of the resolution of your CAD file itself, you may have certain parts which are not completely fabricated. Hmm. Okay. So now one thing here to avoid the electron scattering, what do we do? The electron energies are optimized. So we use either very high energy electrons or very low energy electrons. And again, depending on the application, depending on the depth of your structures, depending on the material. Typically what happens is when the electrons have a very high energy, then they can, of course, you imagine they can penetrate deep without scattering very much. Then why would you use very low energy electrons? Because 
that is for a different purpose if you want to make surface structures because in that case the electrons have too low energy to undergo scattering hmm. so either way these two options are used for minimizing the scattering problem okay now what do you do after making the structure with ebl so as we have also seen in the case of x-ray lithography we make one master structure and then we try to make uh, other structures from these master structures similarly you must have also if you remember then i told you during the photolithography sometimes when you want to make very fine features five micrometer or below then you will use a mask that is made by e-beam lithography hmm. So how do you make that mask using e-beam lithography? Now you created some structures in the polymer which are in the, you know, let's say one micrometer uh, is the critical dimension for those structures. Okay. Now what you do is you remove the resist which was unwanted, huh, the degraded parts, and then you do metal sputtering. Hmm. Metal sputtering and then lift off. So this will now give you a mask and then at the end you don't really require the photoresist that you will just dissolve and get rid of it so all the parts all the metal that was deposited on top of the resist that will also go away and the rest will stay there hmm? so these kind of molding techniques uh, lift off techniques and several variations of these techniques are actually used for making a lot of polymer structures some of these are these hard rigid polymers like polycarbonate or uh, pmma but there are also certain softer polymers like PDMS. Hmm. So these, the combination of all of these techniques where you are making a mold and then reproducing other structures using these molds are known as soft lithography techniques. And in one of the lectures, then I'm also going to talk about soft lithography.